Welcome, everybody, to Recovery Machine. My name's Nathan, joined, as always, by co-host Corey. Today, we have a special guest coming to us from Toronto. Uh, Her name's Catherine Botchford, and uh, she's agreed to come on and talk a little bit about her story. How are you doing, Catherine? I'm well. Thank you so much for uh, having me today, Nathan and Corey. You're very welcome. So can you tell us, for our listeners who, who might not know, uh, what happened with with uh, your late husband, Jason? Uh, yeah, so um, it would have been the spring of 2019. Uh, my late husband, Jason, he was a well-known sports reporter in Vancouver. And one day, um, I guess I didn't share this story, but uh, the police showed up at my work to let me know that my husband had OD'd. Um, I never knew that he did drugs. We have three young kids. Again, he was very well known in the community. And so this was um, very shocking, very shocking and um, a lot to deal with. I can't imagine. And Jason uh, was very popular with uh, the Canucks and the hockey world there in Vancouver. I can't, uh, I can't begin to fathom what that, uh, the, what that experience must have been like for you. I guess the one question that I wanted to kind of uh, start with, which is a a difficult one, and uh, to be honest, I was looking forward to meeting you, but uh, the the subject material is difficult. I've lost a couple of friends to what turned out to be or what they thought was uh, just cocaine, and it it ended up being cocaine with uh, fentanyl. I know that's the case, according to the reports that came out of the coroners, uh, that uh, Jason overdosed on, they found cocaine with fentanyl. In his system, many recreational cocaine users in BC have uh, died from what they thought was just cocaine. So I, I am curious, and you might not know, and if you don't, it's it's totally fine. But do you have any indication as to whether or not this was maybe a recreational cocaine kind of unexpected thing that uh, where it was uh, something that where fentanyl was involved and he didn't expect that to be the case, or do you have any? more kind of, I know you didn't have any information on that before, so I just wanted to check. I, as you know, I don't know much. I mean, Jason's not here to tell his story, but I was with him for 17 years and I'd like to think um, I know some information. I don't believe he knew that, you know, fentanyl and cocaine were mixed together. I would like to believe that this was recreational. Was this a one-time thing? I honestly, I don't know. Was Mm -hmm. he an addict? I I don't know. I didn't know the signs, right? I didn't know what to look for. And so I I really was in the dark. I don't believe he was, you know, really, well, he was playing Russian roulette. If you think about, you know, knowing that that was out there, but I don't believe he was using fentanyl on purpose, right? Like the combination, I do think this was a complete accident, unfortunate accident. Um, but I, I really have no evidence to suggest how often he did it, but that's really, like we said, it's not the point. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, even these campaigns, when I did the press conference and they were leading up to, you know, um, talking about decriminalization and you look at the commercials or the ads they always focus on, you know, people in the streets, the downtown east side. Mm-hmm. And that's not what's happening here, mm-hmm. right? And it's, it's. Uh, I think, you know, Jason was the type of guy, he thought he was invincible. We all did. I think most people do when you're kind of, you know, playing around or just thinking that you're you're, you're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a bigger issue, I think, out there. Yeah, you know, just this morning when I was driving – Driving home, CBC Radio announced that the numbers for this year so far, in terms of overdose deaths in in British Columbia alone, were at 600 deaths already. And Nathan and I couldn't agree more, Catherine, that the lens gets sort of pointed at at what society perceives as like the yeah. obvious or the easy angle, but it doesn't tell nearly all of the story, does it? No. Well, even the journey of how did how did people get there? Mm-hmm. Where did it start? And you know, for me, I think we have to look back on, it's not just about taking the stigma out, it's about changing generations of being able to talk about why, like, what what is our coping mechanisms? Why do we go to certain places to cope? And my biggest concern is middle-aged men and, you know, young preteens and teenagers, 
Right? Mm-hmm, and, right. and I can yeah. just share from obviously my experience. Now I can look back and say, oh, that's, it's sad. It's really sad what society is, you know, portraying on men and the ability to not talk. So what is your coping mechanism if you can't talk to your buddies or you have no one to, you know, really talk through what's going on? Mm-hmm. That's a, that is a huge problem, especially with men. You're right. I know it was, it was one that I faced personally, and it was only through the process of actually going to treatment and, you know, taking my, my health more seriously that I was able to find people who I still talk to, to this day, including this gentleman here, Corey, you know, that's the reason why we, we met at all was because we both kind of ran into the same problem. And now we have that connection. And I mean, just the other day, like I haven't been I haven't been doing great lately and uh, I was able to talk to him about, you know, some of these things that, I mean, everybody has their own kind of problems and their own struggles and stuff, but maybe people need to, like you say, work a little, uh, we need to work a little better as a society to, to make it more okay to uh, talk about real things that are bothering us. Yeah. I worry most about, you know, the children, like my kids and Let's just say if Jason was an addict or, you know, people, you have that sometimes in your genes. If my children don't have the ability to talk or have, you know, the, their friend group, what it will be their coping mechanism, right? Where What's their outlet as they get older? And they're definitely way more exposed um, with social media than, you know, we were growing up. And so I think we do have a responsibility, not just to change the stigma today, but like generations to come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know another part of it is that, uh, like you mentioned before, people have a sort of uh, a picture in their mind of what somebody who uses drugs uh, and is the people who they feel that are in danger of overdose. And it's always like they think of the downtown east side or somebody who's uh, struggling with homelessness or something like that. And it's the message that I'm, I'm going to ask you here because, uh, mm-hmm. you know, this is especially important for, for what you've been through and experienced. But how do we how do you think we make people more aware that that is simply not the case and that people from all echelons and you know uh, whether it's socioeconomic or whatever i mean people everywhere are at risk of either you know death via accidental overdose from recreational use or addiction i mean it doesn't always fit into that common stereotype i think we're starting Right, like there's a lot of work to do, but it's it's talking and being vulnerable, sharing our stories. When Jason died, and the coroner, you know, told me that it's quite common for middle-aged men, you know, at certain, you know, that are public figures or in certain high-profile roles, that they actually use it as a coping mechanism. They do cocaine alone, and their families often don't know, and it's not until it's too late, right? And so I think it's sharing stories and and again like not turning a blind eye and being open to these conversations and there's a lot of people that you know we grew up you know drugs are bad don't do drugs right and and you'll go to jail and mm-hmm. so of course drugs are bad but it's also so is alcohol right mm-hmm. so's overeating and there's like there's you know it's all in like how are we actually coming together as a society and actually looking at the pain And what is somebody actually struggling with that's actually, you know, forcing them to do things alone? Right. Like as a society, it's not, well, drugs are bad or you're you're overusing substance use. So you should be singled out. And and we do, we dehumanize it. Mm -hmm. And so how do we actually, you know, really start start the conversation, but then also get to the root cause? Like somebody is clearly, if if they're, you know, going down the, the path that they're, you know, addicted or you know, that's their coping mechanism, there's something else going on. So why is society kind of singling them out? And I I think, you know, society, we just turn an eye like, oh, well, you don't want to be associated with that because we do have those images we see on, on on the news, which isn't the case. Right. Your courage to stand up in front of everybody there, uh, to make that statement with global news there was quite inspiring just because I know, unfortunately, I, I do know other people, uh, I, I know other wives who have lost their husbands in the same way. And they also were high profile uh, people who had very important uh, positions and were well known. And, and they're, for you to, 
to to express what you expressed there, I think took a tremendous amount of uh, courage. So I'd just like to give you props for that. Thank you. Thank you. That was um, incredibly hard, but like I have shared, um, it's bigger than me, right? And and it's just, um, I'm one little story to many, as you've, as you've said, as you've shared. And I think that we have a lot of work to do. And I want to be open with my kids and, and show them that you do have a choice, right? And, and that uh, by using your voice, you, you can enact change. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Watching you in that press conference and hearing, hearing you speak about, about Jason and, and his experience, the effect on me, and I was already at a place where I had left my job, left the environment that where I was using drugs and opiates and was at a lower risk, but felt so, so seen in that moment by you and by this connection with a, with a person who I had never met, didn't know Jason, but hear the story. And I think I, I understand something about that guy and he probably would have understood something about me. Absolutely. And there's like so much power in that mm-hmm. and so much like comfort in that, so much warmth in that to just n- know that there are people out there who can speak it. And I mean, that's, that's the goal of what, what Nathan and I are trying to do here is as professionals or ex-professionals, if you will, to speak what that experience was and what it felt like. Thank you. Well, there's something really liberating about the ability to speak your truth. Cause as I've said, I, I lived with shame and, and just um, fear for a year. I hid it. My closest friends, some of my family members, just they didn't know. And it was just, I tiptoed around the topic of his death because I was, I was scared and I had a lot of shame. Mm-hmm. I was never angry at him. And I think that's, you know, what really pushed me to be able to, you know, finally be free because it's, it's not his fault. Right. And it's like, yes, he had a choice. Absolutely. We all have choices, but you know, we, we all make bad choices, but you, mm-hmm. you shouldn't be, you know, faulted on that or, 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 you know, made as less of human. He's human. We're all human. We're all doing our best to survive. And so I'm, you know, I, I had, even when it did come out, there were, you know, some close people that thought I should be angry at him, mm. but I wasn't, I'm just more angry that I have to raise three kids by myself. Right. Mm. And like, sure. you know, and that he's missing out and they're missing out. Like it's, it's, that's the deepest loss that, you know, he, he made a choice and, and some of it, sometimes you go down the rabbit hole and it's not your, it's, it it's too late. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, Catherine, I, I have a, a quote of yours from this press conference and just, it just ties in with, with what you're saying here. And, and it was so eloquent. His secret became my secret, which became this harboring shame that I carried for over a year. I was so fearful that people would judge him and tear down his legacy. I was fearful that people would judge me for not knowing. And even worse, that they would treat my children's loss of their father as insignificant because of how he died. Mm. It was in these moments that I realized the shame that he must have carried in his Mm. substance use. Yeah. that his secret became your secret. And I, yeah. I know, I think we both know, Nathan, that, that there will be people who b- might hear that, who will really relate to that yeah. and probably had, really heard you when you said that. I had, um, you know, some um, folks reaching out to me that I didn't even know sharing their stories and being able to relate. And, and a lot of what I did resonated with them. So, you know, just by standing up and, and you know, and hearing how what I said impacted you both, and others, and and obviously what you guys are doing, it's so powerful. I think we're just beginning. I think there's, mm-hmm. you know, we we really can change the narrative and you know shed a light that these are humans, right? And and we're all humans, and there's so much more work that we can do. And it's there. It, there is no shame, and that you know they're they're struggling, but their family members are struggling as well. So can we, I hate to take you back, uh, but before you made that decision, okay, I'm going to release this to the world. I'm going to release some of this shame. What was the impact on your process of grieving a public loss in a, within a community that is high profile, you know, Vancouver more than arguably apart from Toronto or Montreal, any other city in, in the country, 
there's a lot of attention on on sports, a lot of attention on sports media. And then to have that kind of enmeshed with this secret and this initial feeling of shame, how did you navigate that? Like that's um, so heavy. Yeah, it's, it's, well, I will share. So next week will be four years. So we're just about to, um, you know, reach the four year mark. Um, Vancouver is a different market. Vancouver is, you know, the community is different. And so I, I knew he was like well known because we would go out, people would recognize him, but he, you know, was very humble, never bragged, would come home, work was work, home was home. And so I didn't get caught, caught up in his Jason Blatchford because he was, you know, our my husband and the father of our kids and we were a family unit. So when it came out and, and um, I realized I had to actually first, I had to release a press release. You know, I was dealing with things I've never dealt with. And I was a very, very extremely private person. And, and you know, my first choice, I, I was with my father-in-law was, well, how, what do we say? What do we, you know, because it was, it was going to be investigated. I did hear this. It was going to be investigated for a year. So I wasn't able to truly say the cause. Mm -hmm. So I thought I had a year. So my first instinct was, you know, protect the kids, say that um, he had an apparent heart attack. I thought that was believable. I was naive, right? Mm. Um, you know, just, I, I didn't know what to do. And then how did I, I get through that? I, you know, I, I guess I just did what I always did. I just put on a brave face in public, but, you know, I hid in the pantry. <laughs> um, you know, to my kids, I would be very honest and say I'm having a moment. But in public, I, it was, it was really hard. It was really hard, but we lived in um, Burke Mountain, the community in Coquitlam, the community of Burke Mountain. And that neighborhood just, they knew what to do and how to take care of me without me asking. Oh, and wow. so that community really came together, the, the kids' school and the moms. And, you know, they'd bring me food, bring us food and take the kids when I needed. And I didn't have to say anything. It was just this most beautiful moment. I, I'll never, never forget what they did for us. And then, you know, the Twitter love, the, the you know, Jason's fans and, and like just the, the articles that came out and I think it was 1040 dedicated a whole day to him. And I sat in my car actually crying and listening oh, wow. to everything. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I got through that. It's one of those things that you look back and you say, who was I? Because I'm not the same person I was. You know, you're, when you go through trauma and loss, you change. But I, I will say the community, how they came together, the, well, actually all of Vancouver, I'm, I'm forever grateful for. I'm beyond moved. I don't think I would have had that same love and support anywhere else in the country or in the world. And I'm, I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there is, there's something about Vancouver and the support. And that's why I feel by seeing that. And when I was able to go out and, and um, do another press release on, on how he died, I was terrified, but I knew it was the right thing to do. And then just seeing the the love and the and nobody judged. Well, there were some, but <laughs> but you know, um, I think that's what made me realize that my voice, you know, my story needs to be told. And and I think we're just beginning, mm -hmm. um, and we can start with Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and if you're able to do what you were able to do there then I think you're going to give other people courage to do the same and maybe not on such so. a menacing or intimidating platform as you did oh. uh, with a bunch of cameras in front yeah. of your face. And uh, I mean, they were I, so welcoming and they were like overjoyed with me being able to tell my story. And there was an acceptance there. And I think that also was um, a differentiator, right? It wasn't like I was just going out and announcing it to Twitter. I was with these like, policymakers mm -hmm. and you know the government and they were embracing my story and wanting to share it because they really really care like they really are concerned about what's happening in BC as we all are and so they're doing they're they're trying as much as they can right and you were genuine and to Jason's fans and and the people that that loved him in Vancouver I, I mean to have to have you come up and and actually give them a, a real answer and not bullshit them like that, I mean that must have uh, you must have got some positive, uh, lots did, of positive I feedback did, yeah. for that. 
it was hard. Yeah. It was really oh my hard. God. I was shaking, but um, yeah. I just, like I said, it's, it's, it's bigger than me. And, you know, before I actually did my, um, my press conference, I actually ran through my speech with my daughters um, because, you know, just to, like, for them to approve and to let them know I was doing this and, and they were really proud and, and I can see them eventually possibly starting to, to have those conversations, obviously when they're older, but I think that's the point. Yeah. You have used the word uh, dehumanized, you know, and, and I think this is, I appreciate how real this conversation is in that I think a question that comes up for a lot of very well-intentioned, kind people, when they encounter someone who's grieving, and I've encountered this myself as a grieving person where people don't know what to say, people don't know what to do. And so in some cases, (laughs) and they're really awkward, in some cases they, they do nothing, or in some cases they back off and pull away when all that person needs is is some kindness and that's sort of what you're saying there is that the the distance that that kindness went for you absolutely and 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 that in the context of of an overdose death there's this looming stigma that is felt and a fear that's attached to that about about speaking it and then how will people react when the, the reaction that is needed is quite a it's like quite a simple basic reaction isn't it it's a human reaction right yeah yeah yeah, and that's the danger of what you experienced there with having to take on that secret, like you said, and then whether or not Jason was struggling over a over a longer period of time or not, we don't know. But many people I do know in that in that situation do harbor a secret like that for a long time, and they and the reason for that is because they're, you know, if especially in their if their job is high profile or they're they they feel for whatever reason that uh, their loved ones won't understand because of the way our culture is and stuff. It's uh, it's got to change. It and, does have uh, to change. Catherine, can I ask you about communicating with kids about this and your own children or any other young people or children that you've encountered, bringing them into the conversation and the connection with stigma and how we talk to our children about this. Yeah, I think my learning, as I said, but first I was, I need to protect them, but by protecting them, you know, I was actually, I was harboring like this ill will, if, if you may. And, and what I mean is that I wasn't being authentic. And so I was hiding really the truth. And, you know, I, I found just by being authentic and, and having open conversations and, and, you know, showing that their dad was human. I'm just going to talk about my kids and that this doesn't change who he was and, and that, you know, he, he made a bad choice. And so we talk a lot about choices and consequences, right? And that everything you do, you have a choice and their potential consequence. And it's just getting them to think through, you know, decisions, right? And, and how what our choices, no matter what you do, it, it's going to impact everyone. There's a ripple effect, right? We're all mm-hmm. connected in this world, right? And so it's like the butterfly effect. But then it's also, I've been encouraging them because they were afraid to talk to their friends. And at first I was thinking, well, no, you shouldn't. But then I said, no, talk to your friends, right? Start those conversations, tell them the truth, reach out to them, right? And and, and don't worry about what their parents say, right? Just start talking to your friends. And so they started to, and they just feel this non-judgment. And now they have someone they can talk to that isn't just a parent. So that's how I'm trying to start you know, that cycle. But again, I think it's being able to talk to your kids about anything, the hard stuff. And Mm -hmm. and you, you know, that generation. And I think our generation or our parents' generation and, you know, before that was a, was, you know, a generation of you don't talk, you bury your feelings, you suck it up, you know, and you have roles to play and when life is hard, just so what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And, and I think, you know, the pandemic has opened up a whole, you know, area that people are really spending more time understanding mental health. And, you know, that also encouraged, I shouldn't say encouraged, but that forced a lot of folks to figure out how do I survive? And and that pushed people to turn more towards alcohol and drugs in a way that we wouldn't have expected. So I, I think it's more about showing that there's outlets, there's, there's ways to get help um, you know, there's professionals. Mm-hmm. And and I always say to the kids, everybody needs therapy. 
right? Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and I'm being honest, I say everyone has mommy and daddy issues and I'm just doing the best I can to make sure they don't spend years and years and years in, in therapy. Right? That's right. Yeah. Um, but we all need therapy. And and so we all have stuff, like you said, but what not everybody feels are safe or the trust to go to a therapist right now, because there is still a little bit of a stigma around that as well. Yeah. So I, I think, like I said, it's just starting the conversations in a, in a safe environment and and showing real examples and that like i said n- does not change who their father was as a person did not does not change his love for me his love for his children and and i think that's very comforting for them going back to when i was in school hearing the the drug talks that's the message i didn't hear was that you're still a good person you're still a professional you're still mm-hmm loved etc it's like it was so this or that like there was black and white black very black and white yeah well you'd have police officers coming in you know when you were kids and you do drugs you're going to jail and so that puts up a a black and white type you know that oh it's bad it's it's illegal which yes but when people are turning to that as a way to cope then there's there's something deeper it's not black and white at all in that black and white, like in between that, there's a seed of shame there, I think. Oh, big time. That like, if I, and this is something that that we've talked about before too, with Nathan and I have talked about that oftentimes like an urge or a craving for a drug or for a drink or whatever, that there's shame in that. And that there's like this feeling of, of being a failure or being bad because you have a very human experience of craving something. Mm-hmm. And that well, like, if we could detach the good or, or bad from that feeling, I think we'd be so much better off. Absolutely. You know, something I've never shared publicly um, is that my father was an alcoholic and he died as an alcoholic. And growing up, I had a lot of shame around that, you know? And, and so what was really interesting was that when Jason died and learning how he died, I thought I should have known the signs. Mm. Right. Or, or maybe, like I said, I don't know if that was like a one-time thing or or whatnot. But I think what really got me to also speaking was, was just thinking back to my dad, middle age, you know, good person, strong, intelligent, but he had his own struggles. That was so obvious because it was alcohol. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so when we talk a lot about substance use, it, it can start, you know, there's functioning alcoholics. There's, you know, probably, you know, functioning, um, you know, people that use uh, substance use Mm -hmm. and that, you know, they just think it's, it's okay. But the bigger issue is, is what's happening in BC. And it's so sad and that all ages are just playing Russian roulette. Yeah. Although it does seem to be, unfortunately, taking more of a toll on kind of the 20 to 50 year old population and men are, are specifically taking this one on the chin. Which is, uh, you know, that's a different kind of problem as a uh, but society. It's systemic. it's systemic, though. So it's like, what can we do to change the narrative around men being able to cry, to have feelings that, mm-hmm. you know, they don't have to carry the, the world on their shoulders. And mm-hmm. that, you know, yeah. you, you two found each other. And, you know, you've built this, what I can see is this beautiful friendship and relationship. And that that does exist. And that, you know... <laughs> I don't know. I don't have the answers. I just, I just think that there's, there's something there and there, there's so much more we can do to, to really look at, you know, what's happening and, and uh, there's a lot more work to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there could be somebody listening right now who's exactly in the same situation that they feel like they've got too much on their shoulders and they're coping in a way that is dangerous. And I hope for those people that they're able to connect with their loved ones if somebody's listening who's uh, in that situation, then hopefully it's uh, it's an inspiration for them. Catherine, what what are your next plans or next steps in in honoring Jason and honoring yourself and your kids? I mean, obviously, we're continuing on in the Botchford Project. The Botchford Project started, it was in 2019. So Jason died April 25th, uh, 2019. The Canucks approached me that summer. And, you know, wanted to do something to continue his legacy. 
And so together, uh, we created what's called the Botchford Project. It's also sponsored by The Athletic. And so what that means is every season, we will put out applications. And it's about finding these young writers that traditionally wouldn't get the chance to be a sports Mm. writer. It is so incredibly hard. I watched Jason like to make it in that industry. It's it's cutthroat. And Mm. so he would mentor a lot of young writers and, you know, up and coming and and really try to show them the ropes because no one showed him like, well, Tony Gallagher and and whatnot did. But um, and so what what I do is we, we send out these applications and we have a select group. And then I choose the the recipients of the of the Botford project. And what that means is they actually get a day to they get to choose a Canuck of their choice to interview. So they do the morning skate and then they, you know, walk in the life of, of a sports reporter for the day. Um, get to cover the game, and then they get a paid article in The Athletic. Oh, and cool. since this has started, every single you know recipient that's gone through this, their career trajectories have just soared. And you know, it's always bittersweet, but I'm I, it's a beautiful tribute to give back and to continue on in his legacy and and just to watch you know, people break through and break new grounds. and uh, you know, just again, just to continue representing representing Jason. Yeah, what a great idea. <laughs> I can only imagine how difficult it is for uh, sports writers right now. That's uh, oh, any especially writers. the Canucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Canucks would be really hard, but uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. there's only, uh, what, probably a million people uh, currently blogging about them at any given yeah. time. But <laughs> My father-in-law, John Lott, who was a very well-known uh, sports reporter in Toronto who covered the Blue Jays. He's retired mm. now. We're talking about collaborating um, possibly on on a piece to talk about the, you know, uh, substance use, um, right? So I, I just, I don't know. I don't really have plans. I just feel if my voice can make a difference, I, I want to, you know, to honor Jason. I, I, we will always honor Jason. Like I said, next week is his four-year anniversary and we'll spend some time kind of looking back and and i always say you never move on you just you move forward Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, that's a great way of putting it very appreciative that you've you've taken the time to uh, come on was there anything else you wanted to tell our listeners before we let you go i think if you're you know struggling you think you're alone you're not um on the other side if you're a family member and you feel alone and there's you're you don't know who to talk to you'd be absolutely amazed at how many amazing humans are out there that really understand and that you can connect with and that there is no shame. You know, this is our opportunity to, you know, change generations and change the narrative and truly save lives. Well yeah, said. For sure. And this is now, we're talking about like thousands of people lost, but also tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people impacted who knew and loved those individuals, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your courage. And we certainly saw you in your in your press conference. We are certain that other people did. And yeah, just grateful for your voice. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.